Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, the lecture this morning is on money and prices. Monetary theory is a very interesting compartment of economics. Uh, it really ultimately addresses the question and, and answers the question of why anyone <clears throat> should routinely and universally accept pieces of paper with ink on them, okay, in exchange for very, very valuable goods and services. Okay, what, how did it come about in history, and, and how is it explained by theory, that today, as I said, people all over the world are, are willing to, to, to accept little tickets or bits of paper um, which uh, intrinsically have very, very little value, or, or, or their, their materials, their inputs, have very little value on the market. And yet, exchange for these pieces of paper with a stamped with uh, various symbols, um, very valuable goods and services. Well, that's really the function of, of monetary theory, to explain that phenomenon. So let's start um, at the point at which money originates. Okay, um, there are, as we know, a number of problems with barter. Okay, whether or not there was ever a, a, an extended, um, developed barter economy, uh, we really don't know. But, but theoretically, we know there are, are strict limits to how much development, how much accumulation of capital can take place under barter because there are various inefficiencies involved in what we call direct exchange, okay, which is another name for barter. Uh, the first problem, which you see in all textbooks, is, is that of the lack of, of coincidence of wants. That is, for any exchange to take place, there must be a double coincidence of wants. Not only must you find someone who has what you want, but they themselves must want what you are willing to exchange for that good. So one example might be a situation in which you have a person, A, who wishes to, um, he specializes in, 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 let's say, producing berries or picking berries, and wishes to obtain shoes somewhere. Okay, so he, he prefers a pair of shoes above the berries that he owns. So he approaches a shoemaker, let's call it B, who indeed possesses shoes, but does not want the berries. Let's say he's allergic to the berries, he breaks out in, in, in rashes and so on. So he, he doesn't want berries at all. And especially if, 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 if uh, the shoemaker was um, one of the few in the area, and, 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 and it was, uh, there were few and far between okay, shoemakers, uh, this person, A, would, would be at a loss. He wouldn't know how to, to um, complete his exchange. Okay? Unless he was ingenious, and perceive that, in fact, there are goods out there that everyone pretty much accepts in a given society. Okay? In which case, he would then approach people who specialize in producing that good, sell the berries for, the, for a quantity of that good, even though he did not intend to use that good directly, okay? but intended to re-exchange it for the good that he ultimately desired, the pair of shoes. And let's say that there's, a, there's somebody who sells weed out there, C. Okay? And people in, in the society use wheat for, for various food products um, and, and, and so on. So he goes and, and exchanges the berries for the wheat. Okay, there are no, numerous, let's say, farmers that sell wheat out there. Um, and some of them want, want berries. In exchange, he gets wheat, okay, which he values sort of indirectly more than, than the berries, but only because he knows he can then turn around and exchange the wheat for the shoes that he ultimately wants. So the wheat goes to B, OK? That is the solution of the, pro, uh, the, uh, the lack of divisibility of wants, OK? And that results in the emergence, not yet of money, but of a medium of exchange, OK? The wheat, in that example, functions as a medium of exchange, meaning that it is purchased or is exchanged for in order to be re-exchanged for something else. So this more roundabout process of exchange actually brings about the solution to the problem. Okay. There's a second problem with um, barter, and that is that um, there are indivisibilities in goods. If someone wishes to sell a horse and, and likes, wants to get some shoes and eggs and, and let's say, legal advice and, and a suit, um, he would have to, with that single horse, somehow break it up. Okay. But in breaking it up, in dividing it up, it would lose its value, right? So he again would, would confront the problem in obtaining the, good that, the, the various goods that he desires from these different specialists. 
So what would he do? He would again go, go and, and, and sell the horse for a quantity of a good that is widely used in the society. Let's say it's weed again. Maybe for 100 bushels of weed, he would exchange the horse. And then he would use certain quantities of that wheat to buy shoes, legal advice, a eggs, and so on. And this then would solve the problem of indivisibility that arises under barter. So this occurred in various societies, okay, independently, that people hit upon a, a medium of exchange. And over time, and in fact, over the millennia, there, were, there was a, a, a self-reinforcing process that took place in which people began to, to, to recognize that other people were more successful in their exchange activities when they, they used a medium of exchange. So the new group of people would, would then emulate those people who were using the um, medium of exchange, and that would increase the demand for, for the medium of exchange, okay? whether it's wheat or whether it's um, uh, salt, as it was in Africa, and we'll go through some of the uh, different types of media of exchange. In any case, as the demand for the medium of exchange rose, it made it even more generally acceptable. More and more groups were drawn into to this, this um, uh, uh, indirect exchange economy. And as, as more people demanded the medium of exchange wheat, its value rose even more, and it became even more generally acceptable. Until over the centuries, okay, and throughout various areas of the world, one or two media of exchange emerged as the general medium of exchange. And that's how we define money, as a general medium of exchange. So that by certainly the Middle Ages in Europe, um, gold and silver had emerged as the general medium of exchange. Um, but as I mentioned, there are there various media of exchange that uh, were used in human history. Um, again, you can see this in textbooks. There were cattle in ancient Greece, leather in ancient Rome, animal pelts, whiskey, and tobacco leaves were used in the American colonies. Um, wampum, which were strings of beads, were used by um, American Indians. Dried fish were used in, in the Canadian maritime uh, colonies. Maize, which is corn, was used in Mexico. And salt and iron farming implements were used in Africa. Wives were actually exchanged in ancient Egypt. Okay? Um, they, they were not politically correct. And um, cigarettes, in the famous German POW uh, example, were used. Now, uh, one other point about money. Um, as money becomes a general medium of exchange, um, it promotes tremendous efficiency in, in the economy not only by reducing uh, transactions costs and trying to find someone to exchange with, but more importantly, by expanding the market and allowing people to specialize in one good, okay, with full confidence that they could exchange that good for the medium of exchange and therefore purchase all the other things that they needed. So it, it tremendously expanded the division of labor and specialization okay, and allowed the accumulation of capital. Just a few um, qualities that are important for a good medium of exchange. Um, first, it must be obviously what? Generally acceptable, right? For, for it to even start off as a medium of exchange, it must be generally acceptable. Uh, it must be widely demanded for non-monetary employments. Certainly this was true of, of gold and silver, which we used for ornamentation, what we used in religious rituals, we used uh, for, for plate and so on, for uh, even, even um, on um, uh, military outfits. It must be easily portable. For example, as I mentioned, iron was used um, in, uh, in Africa. But iron isn't easily portable. That is, it has a low value-to-weight ratio. Gold and silver have a very high value-to-weight ratio. So uh, if today you were to take a, um, if you wanted to buy, let's say, a high-definition television set, um, let's say for $2,000, uh, and we were on a gold standard, you might only have to bring two and a half ounces of gold to purchase the, um, the, the television set. On the other hand, if we were on an iron standard, that would, you know, let's say iron is $300 a ton or something like that, you might have to take six or seven tons of iron. Okay? So um, iron dropped out as a competitor in the uh, emergence of a medium of exchange. Um, they must be homogeneous. All units are identical to one another. Okay? That's certainly true of gold. Okay? Every unit of gold is chemically exactly like every other unit of gold. Right? Now, it's not true, for example, of, of, of precious metals, of, of, of precious gems. I mean, diamonds and emeralds, they could also be used. Okay? But it would take tremendous amount of time and effort 
for each exchange in order to find out <clears throat> their value. Because each diamond, of course, that's its charm, right? Each diamond is unlike every other diamond, sort of like a, a snowflake, right? And so um, that's, that's, that's good uh, for, your, uh, for someone you want to um, become betrothed to. Uh, they're special, they have a unique uh, diamond, expression of your love and so on, but it's not good for exchange. Okay. Um, it must be highly divisible. Again, precious gems, if you divide them up, they lose their value. But if you divide gold and silver up, even to very, very small coins and so on, they ma maintain the, 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 the pro uh, proportional share of their value. Okay. And finally, it must be highly durable. Certainly gold and silver are highly durable. There's still gold in the world that, were dug at, that was dug out of the mines during the Roman Empire, for example, or even before that. The only gold that has really perished is gold that has perished in fires or gold that has been lost beneath the sea when ships were sunk. Okay? But pretty much all the gold that has ever been mined in the world is still in the world. Okay? So that's why uh, you couldn't use dried fish, you couldn't use um, Hostess Twinkies. Uh, I just noticed today that they introduced for the first time the original Hostess Twinkie, which is a, 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 a sort of a little um, pastry, which originally had um, banana cream in it. Um, this is a little off topic, but uh, what happened was they had to remove the banana cream during World War II when bananas became scarce, okay, because they were sent over to the troops. And ever since, they've had vanilla cream. Well, now they've reintroduced, after these many years, the original Hostess Twinkie. But even they wouldn't be good. They would go stale okay, as, you, as you, you held them. Because one of the primary functions of a medium of exchange is to be held so that you can make your anticipated exchanges over time. Okay, okay um, let, let's mention one other important function of a medium of exchange, and that is it does begin to serve as a unit of account, again, in a spontaneous manner. Um, businessmen begin to um, uh, use it in order to calculate their costs and revenues, profits and losses. Okay? Um, it, it makes things easier also for, for, for comparing prices. If, if all goods and services in an economy are compared, uh, are, are priced in, in gold or silver, well, then it's easy to comparison shop to compare prices. Um, think about a barter economy. Even a barter economy with only 1,000 goods would generate 499,500 prices. Okay? So almost 500,000 prices. Okay? Because each good under barter would have a price in terms of the other 999 goods. Okay? Uh, the, the, a, a typical supermarket has 70,000 items in its in its inventory uh, that are on display in the store. Imagine how many price, different prices there would be if you, you were under bar, you, you had a barter system. Okay. Uh, also, not only would the uh, uh, entrepreneurs be unable to calculate which lines of production um, were um, uh, the, 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 the most profitable, but they also wouldn't be able to, to uh, pay the workers. What if, uh, what if you were producing cars? How, how would you pay your workers with, you know, with a part of the car? Okay, I mean, it's, you know, and how many cars would they want if you, if you could give them one a year or something like that? So you wouldn't get the um, ability to accumulate capital as you do on, in a money economy. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about the monetary unit. Assuming that gold and silver emerge because they, they, they um, encompass the, the important qualities that we talked about of a medium of exchange, or they embody those important qualities, um, they emerge on the market, and we call that a commodity money. We now have a commodity money. And the monetary unit then becomes really a weight of the commodity. Gold and silver exchange, both before indirect exchange, that is under barter, and after, as or by weight. Okay? So what we get then is a situation in which the initial monetary units were defined as weights of gold. So that the British pound from 1821 to 1931 what one British pound was defined as one fourth of an ounce of gold. And the US dollar from 1834 to 1933 was defined as one twentieth of an ounce of gold. And the French franc was defined as one hundredth of an, of an ounce of gold, or thereabouts. In any case, what you'll note is that, in fact, the pound, the dollar, the franc, the mark were not different type kinds of money. Okay? In fact, they were all just different weights of the same universal money, which was gold. 
Now, silver tended to be used in, in the East, in India and, and China, so there, and, 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 and up until the 1870s, um, many countries had uh, bimetallic systems, so uh, in which the, the value of gold and silver were fixed by, by, by law, but it was basically gold and silver that, that were used okay, as, as the main commodity monies. Okay. Which brings up the question of exchange rates. Okay. Well, what, what was the exchange rate for about 100 years, between, which never changed by more than 1% up or, uh, above or below uh, the so-called par value? What was the exchange rate between? It was about 5 to 1 by the laws of arithmetic. Okay. Dollar and a pound were simply different weights of gold. There was about five times the amount of gold in a pound as it was in a dollar, so that the exchange rate, the par value, was $4.86 per British pound. And that exchange rate was fixed for, as I said, about 100 years. Okay. Now, we don't call, it's not really an exchange rate. Would we say that um, the exchange rate, be, there's an exchange rate between dimes and, and nickels in, in the U.S. currency? That's not a true exchange rate. No one changes dimes, buys and sells dimes for nickels. In fact, a nickel is defined as a 20th um, part of, of gold. It's one twenty of, of, of a dollar. Okay, it's one twentieth of a dollar. And the dime is, is, is defined as one tenth of a dollar. Okay? So since a dime represents twice as much of a dollar as, as does a nickel, the, by the laws of arithmetic, they, it's two to one, okay, two nickels for, for a dime. Okay. They're, they're not really true exchange rates. True exchange rate involves an exchange on the market in which prices can change. Right? Okay, so if every mo monetary unit was um, uh, really just a weight of gold, then you would have a system like we have today in the U.S. where the dollar is simply money throughout the U.S., okay? So, so the world, or at least the, 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 the countries that use the gold standard as their currency, were really one a part of, of the same currency um, area, okay? Just as everyone who uses the dollar in the U.S. is part of the same uh, dollar area, okay, which is the currency of the U.S., okay? Now let's talk a little bit about the supply of money. Uh, under a gold standard, it's easy to calculate the supply of money. Um, it's really the total monetary gold in existence. Okay? And initially, when the gold standard did emerge, it was a 100% gold standard. People simply used full-body coins and, bu and bars, which are called bullion, to, to make their exchanges. Later on, um, what we call fiduciary me media, or banknotes, arose, okay? which were convertible into gold. But initially, it's simply the money supply is equal to the total weight of gold. So we would, would add up the money supply in this room if we were on the gold standard by just finding out how, much, how many gold coins and gold bars everyone had okay, in terms of weight. Okay. Now, <clears throat> given those preliminaries, how is it then that the value of money is determined? <clears throat> Well, given that we've, we've emphasized that money is a commodity, okay, like any other except in one respect, which I'll get to, every commodity's value or market value, more precisely, or price is determined by supply and demand. And the same is true of money. Okay? Supply and demand determines the value of money. But before we get to what the value of money is, we have to talk a little bit about, or rather how it's determined, we have to talk a little bit about exactly what the value of money is. Let's introduce the term purchasing power at this point. The purchasing power of any item is the amount that it can purchase on the market. So uh, if a pizza sells for $10, okay, if the pizza has a price of $10, we say that the pizza has a purchasing power of $10. You can buy $10 with a pizza. Okay? We're not used to thinking of, of buying money. But when we talk about money, you have to now look at the other side of the coin. Okay? Every exchange or half of every exchange involves money. So the person with the money is buying the car or buying the pizza, but the person with the pizza or selling the car is purchasing money to be held for a longer or shorter period of time, uh, to be demanded okay, by, by the person that's buying the money. Okay. Right, so if you say then that, that the, pizza, um, has, the pizza has a purchasing power uh, of, of $10, you can turn that around and say that um, in, in, in terms of money, 
one dollar, okay, if that's the monetary unit, buys one-tenth of a pizza. So what we can show then is that the purchasing power of money, and I'll call it the PPM following Murray Rothbard, okay, is the reciprocal or inverse of the, of the money price of different goods. Okay? So if a, if a high-definition TV costs $2,000, then the purchasing power of money in, t in terms of, of TVs is one two-thousandth of a television. Okay. And Murray Rothbard in, in his book gives a very simple example of a four-good economy. Actually, it's a five-good economy. Um, in which there are eggs, butter, shoes, and TV sets, all of which are priced in money, because now we know that money is a general medium of, of account. And notice that um, these are the money prices. Now, given that these are the money prices, what would be the price of money? Well, we see immediately that unlike all other goods in the economy, okay, this is one difference between money and other commodities, money does not have one price. Okay? Every other good has a single price. Okay? It's emerged out of barter, it has one price. Money has at least four prices in this economy. It has a price in terms of eggs, butter, shoes, and TV sets. So, we can then state the pa purchasing power or price of money as an array. Okay, it's not a unitary figure. It's not a single figure. It's an array of alternative goods and services that the monetary unit can command or purchase. So, a dollar can purchase either two dozen eggs, which are 50 cents apiece, or one pound of butter, or one twentieth of a pair of shoes, or one two hundredth of a TV set. So money is still in a state of boredom with all other goods and services, paradoxically enough. Okay? Or another way of putting that is that money does not have a single market. All other goods and services have a single market in which they're exchanged for money. Which brings us to the relationship between overall prices, the prices of goods and services, and the purchasing power of money. Note something here, <clears throat> that if suddenly all prices were to double, Okay, let's say due to, due to inflation of the money supply or an expansion of the money supply, we would then have a, a rough doubling of all uh, price of all goods and services, okay, as I show you there in, in the second uh, set of um, figures. Now, in the third set here, we see, in fact, as prices go up, what happens to the value of money? What happens to the purchasing power of, of each monetary unit? It falls, okay, because it's the inverse of, of, of the money price. We simply turn it around, okay? Or turn it upside down. So now um, you can only purchase one dozen eggs at a dollar a piece instead of um, two dozen eggs when, when they're 50 cents a piece, and so on. So inflation, okay, we, that popular saying inflation causes the dollar to shrink, okay, represents this phenomenon, right? It, it causes the dollar to buy less, its purchasing power to shrink more, more appropriately, okay? So now you can only buy a half a pound of butter. Um, a, a one four hundredth of a TV set, whereas before you could buy twice as much of each of those goods. So, to sum up, money, money, the purchasing power of money moves inversely to the price level. So the, the, the value of money, okay, which is, again, the inverse of all the prices in the economy, is determined by supply and demand. Why do we draw the supply curve vertically? We draw the supply curve vertically because at any given moment in time, there's a fixed amount of money in people's cash balances. We use the term cash balances to mean everybody's individual money supply. Okay? So if you want to total up the entire money supply, okay, which we symbolize as capital M, it's equal to the sum of all the individual money supplies in the economy, which we call cash balances. Okay. Now let me explain, for, uh, I'll explain in a moment why the demand curve for money would slope downward and what that means. It means this, that as money loses its purchasing power, all other things equal, people want to hold more of it. Okay? Now, all other things equal, including their expectations. Now first that seems sort of paradoxical, right? Why would people want to hold more money as, as money's value falls? Well, it's the, it's the law of demand. Okay, um, and let me explain that very simply to you. Let's say um, you wake up tomorrow morning and um, 
prices have doubled. You wake up and now you have to pay $4 for a McDonald's hamburger instead of $2. You have to pay um, $6 for a gallon of gasoline instead of $3. You have to pay $20,000 for a Ford tour, uh, $40,000 for a Ford tour instead of $20,000, and so on. But, okay, remember, we're, we're assuming all prices are double and the price of, of labor is also, uh, and, the, and wages and salaries are also a price, the price of labor, they've doubled also. Now you, ha you're, you, you have to make anticipated purchases during the course of the, of, of, of the week. Okay? They're going to cost you twice as much. So are you going to hold more or less money? You're going to hold more money. Okay? Uh, and you're able to hold more money because your, your nominal income has gone up. More, you have more dollars in your pocket because your wages and salaries have doubled. So if the money supply doubles and all prices have doubled, including the price of labor, people are going to want to hold more money to pay the higher prices. Okay? Conversely, yes, go ahead. Have you included the amount in your bank account as having doubled? Yes, what we're going to assume is all, um, all uh, well, that might be a sort of a, a transition problem where, where, where you know, that hasn't doubled. Okay? We're just assuming all prices have doubled. Okay? And maybe you would, would include the price of all assets too, which would mean that you're, in a sense that your, your savings account is an asset and that's doubled. Okay, but that's a good question. Um, so, all prices, so now, on the other hand, if you wake up and prices have been cut in half, have been halved, including your salaries, of course, um, in the long run, you're going to want to hold less money. Okay? It's only $1.50 to buy a gallon of gas. Okay? Lunch costs you half as much. Okay? Uh, you know, a, a, a beer at happy hour costs $1 instead of $2, and so on. Everything is cut in half. So what we get, then, is the downward sloping demand curve. So if the purchasing power of money is very low, down here, meaning that prices are very high, okay, prices are very high when the purchasing power of money is low, okay, um, then people are going to want to hold much more money, and I'll put figures in in a moment, much more money than they would have if, pr if prices were low. Okay? If prices were low, they don't need to hold that much money because each purchase absorbs less, less money. Okay. So the demand curve slopes downward to the right. Now let's talk a little bit about the monetary adjustment process, in which we'll um, explain a little bit more about what, what happens when money, uh, the money supply changes, okay. and how we get to what's called the equilibrium. Okay, let's say that um, initially, for whatever reason, there's more gold in the economy, okay? And so this is the uh, stock of gold. It's 100 million ounces, or 100, uh, let's use dollars, 100 billion dollars of, 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 of uh, money in the economy. Okay. And yet people only want to hold, given the demand curve, they only, at, at that purchasing power, they only need to hold half as much, let's say 50 billion. So they have 50 billion excess dollars, not in the sense that they want to throw them away and don't want them. If you feel that you're holding more money than, than you need, let's say if you just hit the lottery and you have $10 million, you just won $10 million, you're going to have excess cash balances. What will you do? What's going to be your first thought if you hit the lottery? Invested. Either invested or so either buy financial assets or buy consumer's goods. So you're going to rush out. That's how you get rid of excess money. You don't throw it away, obviously, because it's valuable. What you do is you allocate it to other goods that are now more desirable than, than all this money. Okay? So you might buy a yacht, um, you might buy an estate, you might, as you pointed out, invest it in, 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 in stocks or even, even buy a, an entire company. Okay? As you do that, though, as, you, as money's put into circulation, if this is the economy as a whole now where there's excess money in the economy, people rush out and spend the money, and that does what? Inflation. Increases the demand for good, goods and then pr causes prices to go up. That's called the monetary adjustment process. Okay? And let me just uh, set it out here for you. Here. Um, here's what we're going to assume. We're going to assume that people have more money than they demand to hold. Because prices are low, they don't need that much money. Let me move this over a little bit. Okay. So the money supply is greater than the demand for money. Now, using sideward arrows to, to, to mean 
um, causes, that excess amount of money, uh, the excess supply of money causes an increase in the demand for goods in the economy. Okay, so the demand for goods shoot up. As you pointed out, prices rise. People begin to buy more, more yachts, more hamburgers, more of, of, of every item in the economy. As prices rise, however, that means that each dollar buys less and less, becomes less powerful. So remember, the purchasing power of money is simply the inverse of the price level. Purchasing power of money drops, okay? And that leads then to people wanting to hold, having to hold a greater quantity of money. The quantity demanded of money goes up because now people need more money in their pockets as all these prices begin to rise, okay? And finally, we get a situation where the market adjusts the purchasing power of money so that the amount of money in the economy equals the demand for money. So let me put this up again. If you have a surplus of money, eventually, that's not going to last. People are going to rush out and spend the money. As they spend the money, the, uh, the prices will rise, the value of money will drop, and they'll move down along this demand curve to the point where they will want to hold the full $100 billion for anticipated purchases. They will, have, they will feel that they have no excess money that they have to rush out and spend immediately. Okay? Now, the reverse, that's called the monetary adjustment process. The market always makes sure that the price level is set at the point at which people will hold the whole amount of money in the economy. It sets supply of money equal to demand for money. On the other hand, if there's a shortage, okay, if people want $150 billion, but there's only $100 billion in the economy, does that mean the economy is going to go into recession and people be laid off? No, not necessarily. What's going to happen is that, um, again, thinking about it on the individual level, if you suddenly find that you can go on um, a cruise uh, for a real bargain, okay, and you have to come up with, a, let's say, $3,000 for you and, and your spouse uh, to go with your friends on, let's say on a cruise in, 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 in the Caribbean, um, and you have to come up with that money, let's say, within a month, what are you going to do? Okay. If people then suddenly require more money than they're currently holding, you cut back on, on your spending. Okay? That's how a monetary shortage is adjusted. Now, if everybody wakes up one morning and feels that there's going to be uh, a recession and that they, they're going to face greater prospects of being laid off or not getting their bonuses or having their salaries cut, they're going to feel that they have a shortage of money. They're going to be uncertain about the future. And uncertainty about the future is going to cause them to demand more money than they would have. So let's assume that the uh, prices are quite high in this economy. The purchasing power of money is low. Okay? And people want to hold $150 billion instead of $100 billion. Well, how are they going to do that? Well, again, it's the monetary adjustment process. As everyone st cuts their spending, prices are going to fall. All of the, these arrows are going to be reversed. Prices will fall as people demand fewer goods, which means that the price level will go down. The purchasing power of money will rise now. Each dollar will buy more as prices fall and people will feel that they don't have to hold as much money as they did before, so we will move up this demand curve. Okay? People will demand less and less money okay, as prices fall. So you know, take a radical example. If prices were one-tenth as high tomorrow, okay, if it was cut by, by 90%, okay, so that an automobile was $2,000 instead of $20,000, and gasoline was, was 30 cents instead of $3, and you had the same amount of money in your, in, your, in, your, in your checking account, what would you do? You'd rush out and spend it. Okay? Um, or on the other hand, if prices were, were to you know, triple tomorrow, okay, you would need more money, so you, you'd have to cut your spending. All right? so, that, so what we're saying here, and this is a very important point, is that <coughs> there is never a need to increase or decrease the supply of money. The market will always adjust the price level to a level at which people are satisfied with the amount of money that they are holding. Okay. <clears throat> Second thing to keep in mind is that, like any other price, the price of money, which we call the purchasing power of money, is determined by the market. Okay. Now we can talk about inf inflation and, and, its, and its consequences. The original definition of inflation, which I think was used pretty much up until the early 20th century, okay, even into the 1930s, 
Inflation means a volume, right? You inflate a balloon, a volume that has, has, has more than two dimensions. It meant, initially, to increase the supply of money. That was what inflation, um, that's how it was defined, as an increase in, in, in the supply of money. Um, lay, and one of its consequences, but not the only one, was a rise in prices. Later on, especially after John Maynard Keynes wrote his famous um, general theory, his treatise, uh, in 1936, uh, but actually even it started before that, economists began to use inflation as a term denoting the consequence, one consequence of inflation, which was the price level rising. Okay? But you can see that inflation refers to a volume expanding, which is like the volume of money expanding, not to a level going up or down. Okay? But they, nonetheless, that word was then applied. Now, there was a problem with that, uh, using inflation to denote or, 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 or um, uh, uh, refer to a change in the price level. And that was this. There are many other consequences of inflation, uh, uh, pushing, artificially lowering the, the, rate, uh, the rate of interest or uh, pushing up the prices of real estate and, and financial assets. Okay. All of that is ignored when you use inflation to denote a, a change in, in consumer prices, which, which, which is now used, to, is the way it's used today. Okay. So let's just look at a change in the money supply. Um, let's say that, um, well, actually before I do that, let me, let me quickly mention one other thing. Um, and that is that over time, people became used to using uh, fiat money, okay? Uh, that is paper money. Um, and so, so that got, uh, we'll get this in a little bit more detail uh, in, in a moment, but, but for now, governments were able to manipulate the supply of money. Okay? Even when it was convertible into gold, they, they had some power to manipulate through the banks the supply of money. So let's see what happens when you have an increase in the supply of money. So now you have a quantity of $100 million initially, $100 billion in the economy. Okay? And here is equilibrium purchasing power. Purchasing power of money is at, at point A. There's a certain level of prices. Overall prices for different various items are, are at a certain level. And then there's an increase in supply of money okay, by $50 billion. People now have $50 billion more than they, they, they need. So they rush out and they spend the $50 billion. Well, that's where the monetary adjustment process comes in, sometimes called the inflation adjustment process. What occurs then is that as people rush out to spend that extra money, prices rise to the point where the purchasing power of each dollar falls, and we eventually get um, lower, lo uh, higher prices and a lower purchasing power of money. Okay? So we have had inflation. Now, what, does that, what changes occur as a result of that? Does that benefit society in any way? Okay? In fact, even though the money supply has increased by 50%, 50 there are no more goods in the economy. There's the same amount of goods in the economy. They depend on the available resources the amount of capital and, and, and technology, okay? They don't change, okay? Assuming those things are constant, okay? What happens is, is simply that prices are pushed up, but the real money supply does not change. So if, 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 the, if a central bank increases the money supply, wanting to give people more purchasing power, they don't succeed in doing that. All they do is they raise the, the, the price level in the same proportion as the money supply. So to give you a simple example here, if uh, pizza is the good that we're talking about in the economy, it's, let's say the, the representative good, when we have $100 billion, let's say that pizza is $10 a piece. So it's $10 per pizza. Okay. The real money supply is defined as the money supply divided by the price level in the economy. So if we use pizza, we divide this by $10, and it's $10 per pizza. What we get is a real money supply equal to the amount of pizzas that the $100 billion can, can buy. And that's simply 10 billion pizzas. So the real money supply is always stated in terms of goods. How many goods can the money supply buy? It can buy 10 billion pizzas. Now let's see if the Fed has, or, or the central bank has changed anything by increasing the numerator. So it's increased this money supply to $150 billion. Prices of pizza have gone up to $15 by 50%, by about the same proportion as the increase in the money supply. Pizza. What's happened to the real money supply? Has it changed? 
No, it's still 10 billion pizzas. Okay? So there is no change in, in, in the money supply. All, people just have to carry around more money and have to pay higher prices. Okay? They don't have any more purchasing power because there are no more goods in the economy. All right, now let me just, uh, um, let's see what happens when we get a uh, change in the demand for money. Okay. Why might the, the, the demand for money change? Well, people might want to hold more money, as I said before, because they fear a recession in the future. Or there might be an increase in the amount of money that people want to buy because there's more goods and services. That is, there are more, uh, we have economic growth and there are more computers being sold on the market. So that exercises an increased demand for money or represents an increased demand for money. So let's say we have an increase in the demand for money as a result of economic growth. That is, we had initially, let's say, the $100 billion, but now, um, let's just make, make this a 50% a, you know, increase. Let's say there's a tremendous amount of economic growth in a given year, this wouldn't happen, but 50%. There's 50% more goods and services on the market because of, of growth. So those sellers want to sell those extra 50% of goods and services. How can they sell it, those extra goods and services, with the same money supply? Doesn't the Fed need to step in and increase the money supply out to this point here? Okay, move this whole line out here so that now, at the same prices, they can sell the additional computers and other things that, that have, have increased in supply? No, not at all. Okay? In fact, what happens is that as, you, as the demand for money increases, people suddenly, or, or the people that have the extra goods and services, realize that they have to do what? They have to lower the prices, okay? They have to lower the prices. As has happened, as we, as we talked about in, in the high-tech industries. Even if this is a demand to hold more money and not to sell more goods, but to just hold more money uh, because people are, are fearful of recession, what, what will people do? Um, even with the same amount of goods in the economy, they'll cut back on the amount of money they're spending on goods and services, and that will lower prices. In either case, the increase in demand for money will, will result in lower prices. So let's say prices are cut in half, to make it simple. Okay, now there's something di um, the market does increase the real money supply. Okay? So an increase in the demand for money will increase the real money supply. That increase in demand emanates from private people. So let's say that um, the money supply remains at $100 billion, but demand more or less has doubled, let's say, to make it a simple calculation. Um, if demand doubles, what happens is that price of pizza are cut in half, right? Price of pizzas are cut in half. And what's that? Okay, let me move it up. Thank you. Price of pizza is cut in half, and calculating the real money supply here, M over P, how much that $100 billion can now buy. With prices lower, that $100 billion can now buy, per pizza, can now buy 20 billion pizzas. What has happened to the real money supply? It's increased. The market has increased the real money supply. Why? Because people wanted to hold more money, or they had more goods that they wanted to sell for money. Okay? In either case, prices have adjusted. They've come down so that people now, with the same amount of, of dollars, each dollar has, is worth twice as much, right? So if each dollar is worth twice as much, then by holding, let's say you hold $1,000 in your bank account on average, that $1,000 now does what? Buys twice as much. Okay? So every part of that money supply has doubled in value. Every dollar of that $100 billion, okay, as prices have come down. Okay. So in contrast to an increase in the supply of money by the government, which does not increase the real money supply and does not give people any more satisfaction, an increase in the demand for money, which lowers prices, do, does make people better off because it makes their cash balances more powerful. Okay. Okay, now we come to an important question, and that question is this. Um, what is the optimal supply of money? Economists use that term optimal, okay? Or another way of putting it is, what should the supply of money be, given the analysis that we just went through? Is there ever a reason to increase the supply of money or to change it? Yes. The economy grows. Okay, well, one, that, that, that's, that's the biggest 
Uh, that, 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 that's the, the, the main objection. Uh, certainly in the case of economic growth, we need more dollars to buy these extra goods. Okay? But if you look again at, 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 at areas of sectors of the economy that are growing, they adjust fine without big increases in, in the supply of money. Um, as I mentioned, you know, when, when personal computers were first introduced, they were $20,000. Now they're, they're, they're $500. When uh, hand calculators were first introduced in 69, they were uh, $350. Now they're five dollars. So growth in any sector is no different than growth in the economy as a whole, because the economy as a whole is composed of all the various industries okay, and sectors. So you don't need an, an increased supply of money to, to um, accommodate economic growth, because in fact, the, the demand for money will change in such a way that it will lower prices. Okay? Um, now here's a way of, of approaching this, and, that, and, and, and it's as follows. Here's where money is different from the other, uh, the other classes of commodities. Okay? Think about a consumer's good. Consum the function of a consumer good is to, um, to, to, to yield direct satisfaction to consumers. Okay? Now, in functioning as a consumer good, a thing is generally either used up immediately in the case of a, of a meal or used up over time in the case of an automobile. Okay? In either case, in performing its function as a consumer good, things are used up. Same thing with capital goods. Okay? Almost all capital goods, whether it's a factory or it's a raw material, it's used up in the process of production. But what about money? Money is neither a consumer good or a, or, or a producer good. Okay? Producer good yields indirect satisfaction. Consumer good yields direct satisfaction. The function of money is to be obtained, and then re-exchanged for something that you desire more. Okay? So the function of money is to be re-exchanged. It's like a hot potato. It's passed throughout the economy. In performing this function, do the, uh, either fiat dollars or, or, or silver or, or gold, is it part of, of that function to be used up? No, it's not part of it. Now, there might be some wear and tear, and there are, is wear and tear on gold and silver. And, and, the, and the paper dollars do have to be replaced every five years or whatever it is. But, but that's not an inherent part of, of, of the function of a medium of exchange. It's just to be re-exchanged. It's not to be consumed either in producing consumer goods or in, in satisfying directly human wants. Okay? So given that, we can then um, use what Murray Rothbard calls the Angel Gabriel model to show why you don't need uh, uh, an increase in the money supply. Um, and uh, Milton Friedman calls it the helicopter model. Um, basically what happens is that there's a, a, an angel out, uh, up there who wants to benefit humanity but is economically ignorant and decides that since a given person, when, when their money income increases, he, he, he observes that given, a given person is, is better off. Well, he's going to make everybody better off by doubling their cash balances. So when you wake up tomorrow morning, you're going to have twice as much money in your wallets, purses, and in your bank accounts. Okay? So he does that. He doubles the, the money supply. Everyone wakes up. Okay? First, let's assume everybody wakes up at the same time, okay, for simplicity. And what do they do? At the same price level, they now have more money than they want to hold. Okay? They don't need to hold twice as much. They already adjusted their cash balances to what they needed to hold. Everybody rushes out and spends it, and almost immediately what happens to prices? They rise, and you get inflation. The angel has not benefited anyone. All that has happened is that we have twice as much money and we have to pay, our prices are, are, are twice as high. Uh, the real money supply has not changed, okay? So there is no social benefit conferred by an increase in the money supply, okay? Any quantity of money, this is, this is sort of Ricardo's law, one of the first economists to, to recognize it, David Ricardo, any quantity of money is sufficient to perform the function of a medium of exchange. If there are $50 billion in the economy, in, 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 let, let's take three economies. Economy number one has $50 billion, number two has $100 billion, number three has $150 billion. Okay? Uh, and all of, everything else is the same. Okay, they have the same, type, same consumers, laborers, uh, goods, technology, everything is exactly the same. Is the economy with $150 billion better off than the economy with, with $50 billion? No. The only difference is that prices are three times as high in the economy with the greater supply of money. Okay? That's the only difference. There is no increased 
satisfaction of human wants. Now, if the angel had known some economics, he'd come to this, this seminar <laughs> and paid close attention to, to the Salerno part of the seminar, he would have, he would have realized um, that the way to benefit humanity was to do what? Not to increase the supply of money, but to increase the what? Good. Well, if you, if, if you woke up and you had a, a second car in your driveway, or if you had two and you had four cars in your driveway, everybody had twice as, as, as amount of goods, and you had a second home, and so on, everybody would be better off because more human wants would be satisfied. The same thing is true as if he decided to double the amount of producer goods, okay? the amount of capital goods in the economy, the amount of factories, the amount of software programs, the amount of computers, and so on, um, of trucks. People, eventually, those things would, would allow the, the fixed amount of labor to produce more goods and services, and the economy would, again, be better off. Okay? So that is another way in which the commodity of money differs from, the, from, from producers' goods and consumer goods. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about, um, oh, let me introduce a twist into the Angel Gabriel scenario. Let's say some people are early risers. Okay? Um, some people get up early. I know Lou Rockwell gets up very early. Okay? He has to have every, you know, his, his, his page up, uh, lourockwell.com. So he gets up very early. And he finds that um, his, his, his money supply is doubled. Okay? Now, Peter Klein lays around. He's kind of slothful. Lays around in bed, reads the paper, so on. Do- doesn't, doesn't venture out until 11 o'clock. He's a typical college professor. The are making me sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, what happens? Lou Rockwell and others like him rush out and spend the new money. What happens to prices? Well, they buy when prices are still at their old level, okay? And so prices begin to rise. And as the people who get up a little bit later have to face slightly higher prices. However, when Peter Klein gets up and goes out, he finds out that prices are almost, have, have, have increased tremendously. So in effect, what has happened is that he has, wealth has been transferred from Peter Klein to Lou Rockwell, okay? Which, uh, that increases social welfare in, in my estimation. <laughs> um, so what happens is that the people who receive the new money late are, 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 are victimized by the inflationary process. And the people who receive the new money first are the ones who, who, who gain, okay? Because they buy before prices have risen. So the purchasing power of their dollar is still high. Whereas Peter Klein buys after the, the um, prices have risen. And so the purchasing power of his, of his dollars have, have already declined, okay? We're going to come back to that point again. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit, about, a little bit more about um, government paper money, okay? Uh, and how it came about, because I want to get to the, uh, the case of hyperinflation here. Um, initially, the kings monopolized uh, the mining of gold and silver coins, okay? And they charged their, their, their subjects a monopoly price. So they took over, they, they banned uh, private minting of coins, which had existed, okay, in various parts of Europe. Um, and they charged a monopoly price, and that monopoly price, for your own information, was called seniorage. The right, of, uh, representing the right of the Lord, okay, or the prerogative of, of the Lord of the manor or of the king to um, monopolize the, 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 the process of minting coins. Okay. And seniorage um, would also, now I don't know how, how apocryphal this story is, but it's interesting, so I'm going to tell it. Um, it also re- referred to the right of, 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 the, of the feudal lord to spend the first night with the bride of, of, of his vassals. Okay. Um, that, and now, that was never actually um, enforced. What they would do is that the vassal would have to pay him a sum of money to, uh, to, so, so that he would renounce that right. Okay. Um, so supposedly, this is where the term seniorage c- c- comes from. Now, I've heard that story, and other people have said it's, 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 it's apocryphal. That is, that it's it's, 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 it's a made-up story, okay? It has no basis in fact, but um, it's, it's, it's a good story to tell. I mean, because you know, the government basically screws you when it's, uh, um, you know, um, minting money or, or, or at, at monopoly prices or, or, or producing uh, paper money, okay? So now, the important point here is that when you have um, the, the king monopolizing the mint, um, they can engage in what's called debasing the coinage. Okay? 
They can do it in a number of different ways. There's something called sweating the, sweating the coins, where they, 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 they call the coins back. When a new king comes in, let's say King Nitwit now ascends to the throne. Okay, so King Nitwit now ascends to the throne, and he wants his picture on the coins. Okay, so he calls the coinage back, and he'll um, put his own picture on, on, on the coin, you know, and, and he'll name it the Nit. Okay, and let's say the Nit was initially one. Um, does it look like Peter? The nose in here. Okay. <laughs> um, the net was initially one full ounce of gold, let's say. What he'll do is he'll reduce the gold content to, let's say, nine tenths. And he'll debase it by adulterating it maybe with a copper, okay? Recoin it with some copper in it, a bit, which is a base metal. Or he'll sweat the coinage. That is, he'll, um, uh, he'll put it, the coins in a bag, and he'll have his, his lackey shake the bag, and, and the gold, you know, and, and the loose piece of gold will fall off the coins, and then, then he'll give the coins back. They'll be lighter weight, and he'll use obviously the, the, the residue and coin that into coins and use them himself, as he would if he clipped the coins. Clipping the coins is just uh, shaving off the outer edge. Okay. Um, in any case, the amount of the precious metal becomes less, but yet the name Nit sticks. Okay, and he may uh, he he's, he now has more revenue. Okay. And so the kings can only get away with this, you know, once or twice during their reign, all right? Sometimes they'll call back the coins because it's becoming lightweight, okay? And they want to recoin because it's becoming, um, the face of it is becoming sort of, it's becoming defaced uh, as it's being used. So he'll, he might, may call it back for that reason. And again, he debases it, okay? Over time, uh, uh, coins have been tremendously debased. For example, I, I don't have it here, but the... Uh, in Spain, um, you know, the, the coinage was the base of the point where the coins had become so small that they you couldn't even, you know, they were too small to even circulate, okay? The key point, however, is that people begin to think of the monetary unit not as an ounce of gold because now it's, you know, a half an ounce of gold or, or a quarter of an ounce of gold. It keeps getting smaller and smaller. They think of it as the knit, okay? So they, they accept the name as the monetary unit and not, not the, 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 the weight, all right. Now, uh, in order to gain general acceptance okay, for paper money, once the, the, uh, the printing press was, was invented, uh, government saw that you, know, you can only debase a coinage so far. Okay, there is a limit, obviously. Um, so inflation can't extend very far under the gold standard. But if you can print paper, then it will. So how did they get paper into circulation? Well, given that people were now accepting the names, like, like franc, mark, dollar, rather than the weight, Okay, as, as, as the um, monetary unit, the kings then ga would guarantee the redeemability on demand initially. They would say, look, you accept the paper money we issue, we will pay you the full uh, amount in gold if you come back with it. Uh, and the paper money is more convenient and so on. Um, uh, th they also said that they would accept the paper money in uh, payment of taxes due. Uh, and they imposed legal tender laws that forced people to accept the paper dollars in full discharge of of, of debts incurred in the gold dollars, okay, at par, okay, or gold nits or whatever it is. Okay. So for all these reasons, paper money got into circulation, which then allowed the kings to pay for their wars and building palaces. Basically, that's the two things that they, they, they you know, spent their budgets on. Um, they, it allowed them to issue or to get banks, the banks, to loan them paper money Okay? And to use that paper money to pay for the wars and to pay for the, um, the palace building and, and other boondoggles. Okay. Um, so the, the government then had began inflating through paper money and secretly redistributed money from the populace, from the citizens, to itself. Right? And they were able to run uh, uh, budget deficits. Because they could finance it by paper money. Under a full gold standard, it was very difficult. You really couldn't run budget deficits unless you get somebody to lend you the gold. And um, so, so it was a narrow limit on the amount of deficits you could run. And in fact, you know, there are stories of armies just you know, leaving the battlefield because the kings could no longer pay, pay the wages for the soldiers. Okay. Um, now, Eventually, and I don't want to go through the whole historical process, but by, by, by um, in 1914, well, generally during wars, um, all countries went off the gold standard. That is, they um, suspended the redeemability of the paper money for the period of the war, promising that they would go back after the war and, um, and, and redeem the paper money again in gold and silver uh, at par. 
Okay. But during wartime, they went off, off, off the gold standard. Okay. We, uh, the United States did during the Civil War. Um, Great Britain did during the wars with Napoleon in the early 19th century. Every belligerent did in 1914 and stayed off the gold standard until well after uh, the war ended. And finally, um, in the 1930s, 31, Br Great Britain went off, 1933, the U.S. went off, 1936, France and a, a number of others in, 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 a, in, in a monetary block with France went off the gold standard. So that really, after World War II, we didn't have, we went back to a, a very watered-down, phony type of gold standard. We pretty much had paper money, okay? But during wartime, uh, even earlier, as I said, nations went off the gold standard. This allowed governments to, to, to print money without any limit to finance the wars, okay? And we got the phenomenon, okay, of hyperinflation, okay? The phenomenon of hyperinflation arose. The most famous inc incident of hyperinflation was of that of, of, of Germany after World War II. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, World War I, excuse me. Um, in the early 1920s. Basically, Germany had, um, if you take 1913 as a base year, okay, what, and, and take the price level as, as equal to one, right, the price level rose one trillion times by 1923 okay, in Germany. Let me just read you some of the interesting, what happened was that the government, of course, kept printing uh, money, especially, it, it had to pay reparations by the Treaty of Versailles. The German government had to pay reparations as well as, as the other members of, of, of the German, um, of the alliance, had to pay to, to, to the, the uh, French, British um, for the damage allegedly caused by the war. And um, there's some interesting stories about how bad this inflation um, got. And what I want to first do is to show you the price of a German newspaper. It's a very good way of getting a feel for the magnitude of the inflation, okay, rather than just using a price index. Something like a, a newspaper um, is an everyday item. Its quality doesn't change much. It's pretty much the same over time. So it gives you a good idea of the, of the magnitude of the price rate, uh, increases, you know, when, when those price increases are large. So if you take 1921, Okay, January 1921, the start of, of the hyperinflation. There was a lot of inflation during the war, but nothing, it wasn't a hyperinflation at that point. Um, it was about one-third of a mark, okay? Then by May 1922, okay, a little bit more than a year later, it had tripled. So the price level had tripled in, 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 in you know, 14, 15 months. That's as if 15 months from now, the price of, of a Ford Taurus would, Ford Taurus would be $60,000 instead of $20,000. Then... From May to October, so from the fifth, fifth month to the 10th to the month of that calendar year, um, the price level went up eight times. By February 1923, the price of a newspaper was um, 100 marks. So from the beginning, comparing it to the beginning, it went up 300 times about. Then it went up to 1,000 marks uh, about you know, seven or eight months later. Then from S September 1923 to October 1st, okay, Within a month, it doubled. And then within 14 days, it went up 10 times. It's now $20,000 20, marks to buy uh, a German newspaper. Two weeks later, it was now 1 million marks to buy the newspaper. Okay? Then 10 or 11 days later, it was 15 million. Eight days later, it was $70 million, 70 million marks. Okay? That's as if... We have, you know, you, you go for a haircut, you know, when, when, when it's ten dollars, and um, then in uh, let's say two years, pretty much, yeah, a little bit more than two years, two and a half years, the haircut is now um, seventy million times that, or seven hundred million dollars. Okay, so that's the magnitude of of the inflation, which caused a lot of, of behavioral changes in people, obviously, especially as prices were going up hour by hour. Okay. Um, you all, or you've heard of, or maybe have seen the, the uh, picture of, or the, or the uh, yeah, it's a picture, a photo, of the German worker with a whole wheelbarrow full of um, marked notes, okay? And, you know, pushing them into a grocery store to, to exchange them for um, just like a pound of butter, okay? Also, um, what began to happen was that people began to demand to get paid more frequently, 
Okay, so workers were getting paid every two weeks. They demanded every week. Okay, because so they didn't want to hold money for a very long time because the purchasing power was declining so rapidly. Then they were, the, they were getting paid every day, and then two and three times a day. And their families would show up at the factory gates, the grandfather, the wife, the children, and he would bring out the notes, and they would give them to, 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 the, to, to the family, and the family would rush out and spend it on anything okay, at that point. Okay? You couldn't even comparison shop because prices were going up minute by minute or, or hour by hour. Okay? Um, you know, even if no one in your family played a piano, if there was a piano for sale, you would just buy it right then. Okay. This was the flight into real values, it was called. All right. um, there was also an, another uh, sort of behavioral change that occurred. Women would begin to bring their laundry baskets full of marked notes to, to, the, to the stores. Okay. But you couldn't fit them down the aisles, so they, they would leave, leave them outside you know, with the notes in them. And thieves would come by and dump the notes out and, and, and steal the baskets, because the basket was more more valuable than, than the notes, okay? Um, college professors, civil servants, they began to quit their jobs because they were being paid every two weeks or every month, and they couldn't afford to wait to get their income because it, w it was declining in value so rapidly. So they became waiters and, and, and taxi drivers, okay? Or uh, and other service people that got paid immediately. So, so you had that occurring. Um, of course, now, the government claimed that, well, we had nothing to do with it, they claim. Okay? Because if you looked at the statistics, what you saw was that prices were rising more rapidly than the money supply. Well, that's very interesting. Prices were going up much more rapidly than the money supply. The key is what we call inflationary expectations, though. And that means this, that if people expect inflation, okay, prices to rise uh, to a great extent at a period in the future, let's say we expect... Um, prices of, 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 let's say, automobiles and, and, and various uh, durable goods to double next year. What will people rush out and do? Buy they'll buy them. They'll buy them this year. Okay? That occurred when we had the first sort of housing boom in the 1970s where young couples were rushing out. Well, young couples, instead of waiting two or three years and saving for a down payment to buy a house, uh, were, were borrowing from, from their families and, and putting down payments on, on their homes. Okay, as the inflation rate increased to the point where, it was, I think, in 1980, it was about 16% per year in the U.S., um, you, you saw more of, of this anticipatory buying, which means that people are trying to get rid of money. The demand for money is falling to the left. The demand for money is going down. People don't want to hold money, or as much money as they did before. They want to get rid of it almost as soon as they get it. Okay? At the end, of course, at the end of an, uh, hyperinflation, no one really wants to hold money. Okay? That is to say that everyone wants, wants, wants to, to, no one who has anything real will sell, or a, a, another type of commodity, will sell the commodity for, for money. But let's, let's look at uh, some of the other things that happened during the German hyperinflation. Um, as I said, the German government pointed to this phenomenon and said, look, it's not us, it's the speculators. They're selling the, 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 the mark very cheaply. Uh, on, 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 or they're, they're, they're short-selling the mark on the foreign exchange market, and that's pushing down the value of the market and causing uh, import prices, because the mark then needed more marks to buy foreign imports, to, 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 to explode. So they blamed on speculators. But of course, it was this inflationary expectations. Not only were they increasing the money supply, but people were spending money faster, so prices were going up for two different reasons, okay? But all related to the increase in the money supply. So um, the government made the, the argument that we're just increasing the money supply rapidly so that people have more money to pay the higher prices. In fact, prices were becoming so high that they were actually developed sort of a shortage of money during, during this hyperinflation, okay? Because sellers were raising the price in anticipation of, of a much higher price the next day. So it was, a, it was a hyperinflationary spiral. So to meet this, the government began to, um, at one point in the Weimar Republic, um, 2,000 printing houses were working 24-hour shifts to keep worthless paper flowing to banks that didn't count it but weighted on butcher scales because they were all like one, one, one million mark um, um, denominations. And I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you some of these. Um, there, there were other, uh, uh, for ex another, um, uh, as I pointed out, many of, 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 the, of people who traditionally, like teachers and professors and um, uh, uh, civil servants who were traditionally paid once a month had to quit their jobs as the rate of inflation soared to um, uh, 
to, as rate, rate of inflation soared in order to take jobs as taxi drivers or wait, waiters, okay? Um, there's a couple other points I want to make here that are important, or that are interesting, rather. Um, okay, yeah, by the middle of 1923, the price of a full dinner on Friday night would not cover the cost of a cup of coffee on Saturday morning. So that's how rapidly prices were rising, okay? Yeah, by the height of the inflation, 1923, an egg that had cost 25 fennigs in 1918, which is much less than a mark, uh, in, cu in currency already inflated by four years of war, so there already had been inflation for the four years of war, cost 80 billion marks. So one egg went from, you know, like a quarter of a mark to 80 billion marks. A glass of beer priced at 17 fennigs in 1918 cost 150 billion marks. Okay. So, what did the government do? Well, it was running the, the, the printing presses 24 hours a day, as I, I mentioned, um, and it ran out of paper okay, to print the money. So what it did was, it, now this is a 1,000 mark note, okay, 1,000 marks. But you see the red stamp across here? When the notes came back to the banks, what the government did was to take a stamp and stamp Ein Milliard marks. That's a, 1 billion. So well, they were just issuing these, just stamping the old notes, the 1,000 mark notes, and they stamped them with 1 billion. And so prices continued to rise. Eventually, um, the government stopped the inflation coal by promising to, um, by, by introducing a new, a new mark, okay, and setting an exchange rate of, of, of one trillion old marks. If you brought one trillion old marks in, you could get one, one new mark, okay. And they claimed that they would not inflate this and it would be backed up by the land. Uh, and so on. Uh, they didn't really go back to the gold standard immediately, but, 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 but they did make a credible effort to stop the increase in the money supply, and so that the um, hyperinflation stopped cold. Right. Uh, very interestingly, there's a story, again, this, this may be apocryphal, I'm not sure, but Austria also suffered a hyperinflation, not as great as Germany, but it was great nonetheless. And there's a story um, about Ludwig von Mises. Um, and it goes as follows. In 1920, Ludwig von Mises, the world-renowned economist, was called upon by frantic government officials to give his remedy for the ever-worsening Austrian inflation. He agreed to meet with them on one condition, that it was to be at midnight on a certain street corner in Vienna. And let me just, uh, uh, um, just insert here the following. Um, most German economists, or economists in the German-speaking world, did not recognize the um, link between money and prices. Okay. They claimed that prices were going up because of speculation on the foreign exchange market, and the government was just trying to keep up with it by printing more money. Okay. A very famous economist who wrote actually a good book on inflation, or rather on money, uh, Karl Helfrich, w uh, had become the uh, head of the, of the German um, central bank and, had, and, and made this argument. Okay. Mises was one of the old, few economists and, 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 and his students, or, 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 or some of his um, colleagues, Okay, who had read his book, that understood the link at that point between money and prices. Um, so to go on, um, he agreed to meet them on one condition that it was to be at midnight on a certain street corner in Vienna. Although government officials were baffled by the request, they nevertheless agreed. When they met, it was quiet except for the continuous noise of the machinery in the adjacent building. When officials asked von Mises how to solve the, their foremost economic problem, he simply pointed to the noisy building and said, First and foremost, you must stop that noise, okay? Well, what was the noise? The noise, of course, was the building was the government printing plant, and the sound was the printing of money 24 hours a day, okay, which was literally happening. So it's, we know economically it's easy to stop inflation. You stop printing money. Politically, it's difficult. Because once you've printed money, as we'll see in the next lecture, you set off a chain of, of effects, beginning with a, 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 an artificial reduction of the interest rate, which causes certain industries to overexpand, and when the increase in money supply ceases, that expansion is reversed and we have a bust or a recession. Okay? So politically, it takes a, a, a lot of will to stop uh, an inflation. But economically, it's very, very simple, just as Mises said. Stop printing the new dollars. Now, again, as we'll see in the next lecture, um, in today's world, the money supply is not increased by literally printing new dollars but through the banking system, by adding reserves to the banking system, which are then um, lent out and turned into bank deposits. Okay. 
Uh, one last point I want to make, and that is um, the German uh, inf- hyperinflation wasn't the greatest in history. It's the most famous, but it was not the greatest. Um, the greatest one occurred in, in Hungary uh, after World War II. And um, after World War II, or, ra- or rather before World War II in 1939, um, the Hungarian currency known as the Pengo, I think it's yeah, P-N-G-O, yeah. So the Pengo had a, had a, had a, a value in terms of dollars of um, 3.3. Three nine uh, equaled one dollar. Now, by 1946, in July of 1946, the same dollar was worth 500 million trillion pengos. That's that's a five and 21 zeros. Okay. Um, So after the war, rural Hungarians quickly abandoned money. Okay in favor of primitive barter. But people in Budapest, the capital, had to, had to cope with the monetary system. Pri- uh, wages were raised daily. Prices rose by the hour. Shoppers carried their money in, in large bags. Okay? Uh, high-speed presses raced to turn out more currency. Um, the upshot was that if you had deposited $100,000 worth of, of pengos in a bank in 1939, let's say you, uh, you, you couldn't get to it during the war, you couldn't get it out during the war, um, they weren't worth the trouble, that $100,000 worth of pengos, uh, to withdraw in 1946, because a haircut now cost uh, 800 trillion pengos in Budapest. Okay? And the average annual income there would buy only about $50 worth, dollars worth of merchandise on, on the black market. Okay? So uh, that was the greatest hyperinflation. There was also one, let me just give you a few, a short summary of the Bolivian um, hyperinflation in 1985. Uh, in one six-month period, prices soared at an annual rate of $38,000. Uh, I'm sorry, 38,000 percent, excuse me. Um, and so they, they take the example of, of an individual, Mr. Miranda. Uh, if, if he doesn't quickly ch- change his, his pay into dollars, um, it, 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 it evaporates. The day he was paid um, 25 million pesos, a dollar costs 500,000 pesos. So he received just $50. Um, a few days later, the rate was 900,000 pesos. So his pay was now $27 just a few days later, okay, almost cut in half in a few days' time. Okay. So that's what hyperinflation does. It's the worst enemy of the market economy. It thrusts the economy back or catapults the economy back into barter. Okay. And that means the breakdown of the industrial economy. Um, so I will stop here and take any questions. Yes, Ron. Well, I have one observation. It does sound like there's one benefit to hyperinflation, and that was to reduce the number of bureaucrats. Based on what <laughs> yeah. yeah, the civil servants quitting their jobs, absolutely. I have a question, though. Uh, if consumers were you know, logically you know, trying to get rid of their money as quickly as possible to get you know, some type of real good out, right. what were producers doing? And wouldn't they tend to have the same uh, attitude about you know, wanting to maybe produce less because they didn't want to give up real things for worthless money? What was, how did it affect them? There, there was a lot of speculation in the sense that people stopped producing, and what they were doing was trying to buy and resell factories. So what they would do, or, 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 or one guy would, um, they mentioned in this article, uh, would uh, bought a, um, they would buy houses, and then they would wait, f- uh, they wouldn't pay right away, they would wait for a few weeks and then and then then pay. So so the sharper people realized that you know if if, if you bought something on time you did better, right? Because the the, the real value of of, of 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 the nominal amount of, of marks was decreasing. So a lot of people made out very very well during the hyperinflation by speculating, okay, on prices continuing to go up. Okay. Yes. Uh-huh. I had my laundry done for three cigarettes. Offered them marks or anything like that. They refused. They refused. This was after World War II? I, I forget, yeah. I, I forget uh, how many cigarettes they told me they had to pay to get a pair of shoes. But it was right. a cigarette. Right. Yeah, no, yeah, cigarettes, 
actually circulated after the war outside the prison of war camps, too. Yeah. I don't know what, what sort of inflation there was with Marx, but <clears throat> people lose confidence. When, when, when a country loses the war, the value of, of the currency goes down, demand for the currency goes down because they think it's going to be replaced by another currency and they don't want to be caught holding it. So everybody tries to spend it. Right, so that's, that's, that's what happened in the prison of war camps, that at, at, when the care packages came, um, at the beginning of the month, prices were higher for razor blades and chocolate and everything else in terms of cigarettes than the end of the month, as people smoked the cigarettes and, and, and the money supply was deflated. That's true. Also in the Philippines, um, right before the U.S. retook the Philippines in World War II, um, the night before people expected the, or a day or two before people expected the um, U.S. to... Um, to, 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 to land, uh, what happened was that they, they, everyone rushed out and spent the Japanese-issued currency, okay, and prices just became astronomical. Because they want, just wanted to get rid of it. They knew it wouldn't be worth anything once, once um, U.S. forces occupied the islands. Any other questions? You had a question? Yeah, I just wondered, was there a <coughs> link to foreign currencies or even gold coins? And yeah, see, the, the, in, in, in Germany during that period, there were U, U.S. dollars, there were coins and so on. Gold and silver. See, it, it, contrasting that with today, uh, if we had a hyperinflation here in the U U.S., we wouldn't have the same recourses as they did. Okay, to, to foreign cu cu currencies and so on. Yes. <clears throat> Gary North uh, gave a great example, of actual case example right. of the hyperinflation in Germany. It always impressed me. Uh, a German bought a farm, uh -huh. paid a farm, and on a mortgage with a mortgage. And when his first potato crop came. Proceeds from that potato crop, he was able one potato crop he was to pay off the whole thing. So had he waited one year, he could have paid it off with one potato. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, that type of thing. See, see, uh, this is a little bit more technical, but 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 people don't have the same expectations. Okay, and Mises pointed that out. Um, in, in today's economic models, you know, everyone's assumed to have adaptive expectations that is based on, on, on what happens in the past, or rational expectations based on, on full information about um, what, what is currently going on and, and what's likely to happen in the future. Um, but, but Mises recognized that uh, people in the cities developed inflationary expectations before the farmers, for example. So people would go out to the farms and buy the eggs and sell them very cheap. But then the farmers caught on, you know, and then even the dullest person would, would, would catch on, okay? And then everybody would develop inflationary expectations. But during that period, okay, as expectations were adjusting, um, you could make a lot of money. Uh, or, or, or let's put it this way, you, you, you could acquire a lot of valuable assets, as, as you just pointed out. Yes? Might one compare such hyperinflation with a market <coughs> bubble in that both are creatures of expectations that are ahead of right. the reality at that moment. Right. And the analogy would work really well with the way the, one, the hyperinflation ended in Germany. That is, the bubble burst. Right. So do you think that model might work, or do you think it's just See, far -fetched? Well, no, I'm not, it's not far-fetched, um, but I would say it's not exactly analogous because a market bubble, well, um, to the extent that there are market, market bubbles, and there probably are. Um, it's reminded of the tulip mania. Yeah, it, 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 that's self-limiting in some sense, whereas the, the government, in the case of hyperinflation, sets off the spot. In other words, there's something else, another factor, and that is to increase the money supply, which is a real factor. And that then, then causes people eventually to develop expectations, which then makes the hyper, intensifies the hyperinflation. Okay? And the government, this, if this other factor stops and it's credibly stopped, then you can, you can stop that hyperinflation. But I guess in some sense, a market bubble is also self-limiting when people see the underlying realities. But what I, I, guess what, I guess that's the point. Uh, with, with the hyperinflation, there is an underlying reality driving everything, and that's the increase in the money supply. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay, thank you.